moment, we invite you to have a date with Judy. Did you ever attend a high school sorority meeting? If not, you're going to attend one right now. It's Judy Foster Sorority, and there is plenty going on. Madam President, there's some new business I'd like to bring up. We haven't finished the old business yet, Sister Judy. To heck with old business. This is utterly vital to the future of the sorority. Okay, Sister Judy, what is it you wish to bring up? Men. Again? Gee, Sister Judy, every time you bring something up, it's men. I can't help it. This time it's devastating news. What's happened, Judy? This year, the boys have decided to make their annual July picnic a stag affair. A stag? Oh. You mean without women? It's a terrific insult to our beauty and intelligence and charm. Gee, and I had a new personality all dreamed out just to spring at that picnic. Girls, we've got to take this matter into our own hands. I move the sorority goes out on strike. On strike? Yes. We won't date him and we won't talk to him. But what do we do with all our time? Well, we can... Well, we can be career women. Career women? But then we'd have to work. Yes, but once we're earning big salaries, the boys will realize we can be utterly independent of them. Madam Chairman, I call for an immediate vote. All those in favor of going out on strike right away indicate by saying... Now, wait a minute, Judy Foster. This is not according to parliamentary procedure. Besides, there's something else sort of stinky going on. Why, Madam Chairman, what do you mean? I mean that you and Gerald Putman had a fight, didn't you? Well, what's that got to do with it? Wasn't he seen the other night with that redhead from Glendale High School? I don't care if he was. Madam President, this is nothing personal. It's just that a stag picnic is an attack on all womanhood. It is? It's the beginning of a trend. I've seen it coming for a long time. Why, men treat girls just like, like anybody else. You're right, and sometimes even worse than that. If it'll help us get to the picnic, maybe we ought to go out on strike. If it'll help me get a date ever, maybe we ought to go out on strike. <laughs> Madam President, I call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Nay. Motion carried. That settles it. From now on, we're on strike. No more men. <laughs> Jeepers, we're off to a ghoulish start. It looks as if our date with Judy tonight is going to be something for the books. And here's a problem that's usually something for the chemistry books. What's NaPO3 taken X times plus Ca3PO4 taken two times? Well, that's not as ghoulish as it sounds. It's the reason why some girls have brighter smiles than others. It's composite metaphosphate, the marvelous polishing ingredient that makes teeth shine and sparkle. And Pepsodent is the only tooth powder in the world that contains this ingredient. That's why no other tooth powder can match the results you get with Pepsodent. Independent laboratories tested dozens of tooth powders. And in every case, the same fact was proved. Pepsodent produces a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So it's just simple arithmetic. If a girl's teeth are twice as bright, her smile is twice as sparkling. Everybody who wants a dazzling smile... Go to your drug counter tonight and say, Pepsodent Tooth Powder, please. Remember, you don't have to exchange an empty can or tube when you get Pepsodent Tooth Powder. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. Here we are, Mitzi. Frankly, Judy, I'm not sure I want a career. But, Mitzi, if we give up men, we've got to do something. And I think it'd be spelled swell being a telegraph girl. Gee, I don't know, Judy. Look, it's just right there in the window. Girls wanted must be able to sing. But, Judy, I really don't have a trained voice. It doesn't say trained voice. It just says must be able to sing. Come on in. Ah, how do you do? We saw your sign in the window, and we'd like to apply for jobs. Ah, uh, good. We're looking for a telegraph girl. Been having some difficulty lately. There's a shortage of boys, you know. Isn't that funny? We've been having the same trouble. <laughs> uh, shall we have a little audition? <laughs> now, who wants to be first? Go ahead, Mitzi. All right, young lady. Uh, suppose you had to deliver this. A special congratulations, 342A. It's to the tune of, do you know, do you can John Peel? Who? John Peel. You know it, of course. Well, not personally. <laughs> shall we try? 
Uh, try to get spirit and feeling into it. I'll give you the pitch. We wish you happiness. We wish you joy. We hope you have a baby boy. And when it's there, begins to grow. We hope you have a baby girl. Congratulations. <laughs> My, uh, you don't have much range, do you? I, I can practice. I'm very sorry. I don't think you'll do. Uh, Tough next. Luck. I'm ready. What do you want me to sing? Let us grapple with a message which presents a real challenge. A number 342C. It's to the tune of Happy Birthday to You. And here's the pitch. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary, Mr. and Mrs. Kendall F. Thurston and family. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. And gee, do they get all that for 26 cents? <laughs> Young lady, you're just what we've been looking for. Now, get your uniform and report for service immediately. Jeepers, Judy, you've been drafted. Good evening, Father. Hello, Mother. Hello, Randolph. Well, what are you supposed to be? I'm a telegraph girl. When did all this happen, Judy? This afternoon. I just got my uniform. Do we have to salute you? Certainly not, Randolph. Don't be silly. Well, to what do we owe this sudden change in your personality? <gasps> Father, what time is it? Uh, five after seven. Why? Mother, tell Father I can't speak to him anymore. Our strike deadline was seven o'clock tonight. Strike? Against men. Uh, against men? Yes, the whole sorority went out on a strike tonight, and I can't speak to Father because technically he's a man. Uh... <laughs> what do you mean, technically? Well... You see, the boys are having a stag picnic and not inviting us, so we're going out on strike against them. We're not going to date them or talk to them. <laughs> oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> Randolph, tell Father this is a very serious matter. Uh, Randolph? Well, isn't he technically a man? Well, during the strike, we've got to have some means of communication with the outside world. So, the sorority has hired Randolph as our go-between. Morally, I'm still on the man side of this, Father. But the girls are career women now, and, well, money talks. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a mediator, huh, Randolph? <laughs> sure. What has the NLRB got that I haven't got? <laughs> Hi, girls. And you, too, Madam President. I can only give you a few minutes of my time. I have some very important telegrams to deliver tonight. Really, Miss Career Woman, you shouldn't waste so much valuable time on us. Randolph will be here any moment to give us a report. A report on what? A report on how the boys are taking our strike. I only hope the boys don't find out how we're taking our strike. Hello, Winches. Here's Randolph. Hello, Randolph. <laughs> Boy, have I got some dirt to dish. Are the boys positively gaga? I'm not passing out any free adjective, Winches. All information is strictly COD. 25 cents, please, in advance. How do we know you've got anything to tell us? Madam President, I just spent a full hour in Scully's drugstore. Listen to all your Julie boyfriend's drool. All right, all right, here's your quarter. <laughs> what did Gerald Putnam say? Let me see. Uh, Gerald Putnam, he said like this. Gee, I wish Judy let me talk to her. Did he really say that? Yes, I think it was Judy he said. Huh? No, it might have been I wish Janie let me talk to her. Or maybe it was Sadie. What did Mervyn say? Mervyn, he said like this. Scully, bring me another chocolate marshmallow super-duper. Is that all? He's a very quiet youth. <laughs> Did you see Howard Teichman there? Oh, yes. Is he miserable about me not talking to him? Howard Teichman, Madam President, he said like this. I think this strike's a good idea. It saves us guys so much money. I don't believe it. You're a nasty little boy. Okay, by me. If that's the way you feel, Madam President, I resign. With certain information now in my possession, I can get a job anytime with the boys. So long, wenches. Yeah. What do you want, young lady? I have a telegram from Mr. Schwartz. He's supposed to be here at the athletic club in a meeting. Well, I guess he's here, but you can't see him. Why not? Well, because you're a girl, ain't you? No girls are allowed to stag party. A what? A stag party. That's where he is. Honest? Yep. Do you believe in stag parties? Well, I ain't for him. Uh, but I ain't again him. Well, I'm again him. How am I ever going to deliver this telegram? 
Could I sneak in real quick and then sneak out real quick again? Nope. But uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sneak in and sneak out again. <laughs> Mister, what happens at stag parties? Uh, you ever been in a hen party? Oh, sure, lots of times. Well, it's the same thing, only uh, kind of a masculine kind of way. Uh, I'll open the door and you take a peek. Oh, swell. <laughs> Just a bunch of men singing and stuff. Yep. Oh, sometimes I wish they'd do something interesting. Well, I guess I'll take that telegram into Miss Swart. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Mother. Ah, it's Miss Mercury. Did you sleep well, dear? No. I was delivering telegrams all night in my sleep. Oh, well. After delivering them all day and then again last evening, no wonder. Yes, I delivered six and a half messages last evening alone. Six and a half? How can you deliver half a message? What happened, dear? Well, the man the telegram was addressed to was in a stag party at the athletic club, and the watchman kind of helped me deliver it. Did you say a stag party at the athletic club? Yes. There were a lot of men who were playing cards and laughing and singing and everything. What were they singing? Oh, like this. Dum, 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 dum. Oh, dum. they were. That's not Tchaikovsky. There's a certain husband of mine named Melvin Foster who couldn't take me out last night because he had to go to a political meeting at the athletic club. Oh. What duty probably heard was a campaign song. I'd like to hear the tune he sings when he comes down to breakfast. Heads up, everybody. By a wonderful coincidence... Here comes Father now. Uh, uh, well, good morning, everybody. How's everything this bright and cheery morning? Hmm? <laughs> well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? Well, isn't anybody going to talk to me? Well, what is the matter here? Melvin, how was that political meeting you attended last night? Oh, a corker. Best discussion of world affairs I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then maybe you can tell me whose national anthem this is. La dee 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 dee. Lord, where have you been? <laughs> where have I been? Where have you been? That's what I want to know. Judy. Yes, Mother. What is it you girls are doing since your men started sagging it? We're on strike. We don't date him and we don't talk to him. Randolph, will you please inform your father that I'm not talking to him and I'm not going after him on any more dates. Beginning right now, I'm on strike two. Shall I deliver that as a straight message or as a singing telegram? <laughs> Judy will be back in just a minute to untangle all this wire trouble. Now, I'd like to send a telegram myself. It's addressed to a man named Case, who's so cross, they call him Crank Case. No, really, they do. And here's the message. Quote, understand you always frown. Stop. Let me tell you about a man who was as grouchy as you, but who now is all sweetness and light. He used to have trouble after trouble with toothbrushes. Scratchy ones gouged his gums. Droopy ones bogged down on his teeth. Then he tried a Pepsodent 50 tough toothbrush. It's the brush that makes people glad to brush their teeth because it feels so good. The nylon bristles are gentle, not scratchy. They're springy and alive. And 50 tufts of them are united to clean teeth better than they were ever cleaned before. Get a Pepsi and 50 tuft toothbrush for every member of your family. And with every brush, you'll receive a cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. A 10 cent bonus for you. And now... Straighten your tie, because we're off again on that date with Judy. Hey, Randolph. Oh, well, hello, Gerald. Are you spying on me? Well, yes, in a nice sort of way. Are you working for the sorority? Well, I don't exactly have a social security number, but I suppose I could be considered as being employed. Well, I've been watching your work, Randolph, and I'd like to make you a little offer. How would you like to come over on our side? Friend, if you can match the pay, you can consider me working for you as of now. Swell. Well, 
Get to work. I have a killer of an idea to break the strike. But it's worth a quarter if it's worth a nickel. I'll give you a nickel. This is strictly a two-bit idea. Well, that's big dough. But this is a big idea. Frankly, Gerald, it's not the money. My sister Judy hasn't had a date for four nights. And, friend, if she doesn't get out of the house soon, I'll go back. Well, all right. What's the idea? Well, since my sister Judy's a telegraph girl... Miss Foster, here's a telegram to be delivered to Mr. Gerald Putnam. To Gerald Putnam? Oh, I can't deliver to him. I'm not on speaking terms with him. Well, if you don't have to speak to him, you merely have to sing. Technically, it's the same thing. Miss Foster, have you ever heard those sacred lines? Neither rain, nor snow, nor sleet, nor gloom of night can stay these faithful couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Jesus, that's beautiful. Then chin up, out into the rain and snow. Why, Mr. Sawyer, it isn't raining or snowing. Technically, it's the same thing. Well, a telegram from me? A straight-singing wire from Mr. Gerald Putnam. Are you he? I am he. You know darn well I am. Well, give her the vocal. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gerald Putnam. Happy birthday to you. Signed, a loving friend who prefers to remain anonymous. I didn't quite get that message. You did so get that message. Besides, it's not your birthday at all. Your birthday's in February. Oh, I'm shocked, Miss Foster. I thought the motto of your company was the customer is always right. Well, you're an exception. Look, Judy, why don't you girls call off this strike? What are you mad at me for anyway, Judy? You know very well what I'm mad at you for. Is it because of that old picnic being stagged? It's a lot more than that. Well, then what is it? Well, when a man has been going steady with a girl for a whole week like you have with me, he, he, he isn't seen with a certain red-headed number from Glenville High School. Oh, but Judy, give me a chance. I'm not talking to you, Gerald Putnam. But you're them talking to me, Judy. I was talking to myself. And if you happen to overhear me, that's just too bad. <laughs> Foster, I'm so glad you're back. There's another singing telegram to be delivered in your territory. Yes, it's right. Uh, by my goodness, isn't this a coincidence? It's addressed to the self-same party, Mr. Gerald Putnam. Oh, caterpillars. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, Gerald Putnam. Happy anniversary to you. Signed, the warm admirer. Lovely, lovely. Just how long have you been married, Mr. Putnam? (laughs) To Mother on Mother's Day. Though your hair has turned to silver, though your cheeks are wan and pale, we will think of you forever and your years of hard travail. Signed, your girl who loves you very much. Oh, that's sweet. Judy, how about a date? I wouldn't go out with you if you were my... My mother! Best wishes to you on Halloween. Salutations on Michaelmas. Greetings to you on Groundhog Day. We hope you have... Gerald Putnam, I never want to have anything to do with you again. Either in person or in my professional capacity as a telegraph girl. Goodbye. Randolph, as an idea, man, you're a dud. I've been sending telegrams to myself all day, and Judy hasn't even given me a tumble. You give me my quarter back. Now, hold on, Tim. I think I can save your investment. I have in my possession an idea that is so good it staggers even me. I'm not interested. At 50 cents, I'm practically giving this idea away. 50 cents? It's guaranteed to get Judy on a date. Well, okay. And curiosity is making a sucker out of me again. But here... What's the idea? Very simple. Just start back with happy birthday and go through the whole thing all over again. Well, Ice Cube, we're home. I had an adorable time, Mr. Gerald Putnam. I had a fine time, too. Great experience. 
The nearest I ever came to dating a clothing store, dummy. Thank you very much. That was a very lovely compliment. But remember, you wore me down. You positively coerced me into this thing. Oh, but gee whiz, Judy. Furthermore, if you don't like my company, you can go out with that red-headed beauty from Granville High School. But I've been trying for hours to tell... I told you at the start of this evening that we're not indulging in any conversation on this date. You forget I'm on strike. Oh, okay. I'll walk you up to the door. You needn't bother. Somebody might see us together. Good night, Mr. Putnam. Okay. Good night, Judy. What are you girls doing here? What do you think we're doing? You strike breaker. Wait a minute. Are you spying on me? You're darn right we are, Scab. Oh, why did you do it, Judy? After you took a solemn oath not to date men. But that wasn't really a date. I was only Come trying on, to... girls. The prize is over now. Strike's over, too. I but, Madam President... Judy Foster, Foster, after this, if you want to do any striking, it's going to be a one-woman strike. Oh, caterpillar. <laughs> Hi, Father. Hello, Randolph. As the only one in this family who is talking to you, Father, I wanted you to know that I feel for you very deeply. In fact, condolences to you on Father's Day. Oh, well, thank you, son. Randolph, do you understand women? Yes, Father, I do. You do? Well, you've got something on me. Father, I hate to see you sitting in here, and the female element of our family sitting in the study, and never the twain shall meet. I'm an old fixer, Father. Do you think you can clear me with uh, Mrs. Foster? Well, for certain pecuniary remuneration, Father. So, dear Randolph, you get your mother talking to me again, and I shall do but handsomely by you. Oh, but, Father... Before I can handle your case, I have to have complete frankness. Uh, frankness, Randy? Yes, Father. Were you at a political meeting at the athletic club, or were you at a stag party? Randolph, I'm going to tell you, man to man, in about 15 years from now. <laughs> You and I are the only two women left on strike. You against Father and me against Gerald. Frankly, I don't think it's very effective. But we can't give in, Judy. It would be a confession of weakness. I'll get it. Hello? May I speak to Miss Judy Foster, please? Mr. Telegraph Office. Speaking? This isn't Mr. Sawyer, is it? No, this is Mr. Sawyer's superior. Your voice sounds very familiar. Oh, <laughs> I uh, don't think we've met. I guess not. I haven't met many executives. <laughs> Funny, for a minute I thought you were my brother. <laughs> Ridiculous. Miss Foster, we've had a complaint from one of our customers. Who? The other evening you were supposed to deliver a message to a meeting at the athletic club. Were you not? Yes, sir. Well, it got to the wrong person. You delivered it to the stag party instead of to the political meeting. Miss Foster. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I... Well, in the future, be more careful. Good evening. Good evening. Mother, I'm in disgrace with a telegraph company. Why? What did you do? There were two meetings the other night at the athletic club, a stag party and a political meeting, and I delivered... A political meeting at the club the other night? Yes, I guess that's where I was supposed to go. That's where your father was supposed to go. But that's where he did go. Oh, the poor man, the injustice I've done him. Injustice? Oh, I can't wait till I see your father so I can ask him for a date. Oh, Judy, as of now, you are on a one-woman strike. Oh, lonely. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Judy. This is Randolph. Guess what I just found out? What? That redhead from Glenville High School is Gerald's first cousin. His cousin? Their relationship is purely as related. I extracted the information myself. Right out of the mouth of the redhead. I'm dying. Oh, poor Gerald. That's all the news for now. Goodbye. Oh, Mother, now that everything's all right, everything's all wrong. Why, dear? Gerald's been too blue to me all along, and I've been treating him like a jerk. Do you suppose he'll ever look at me again after the way I treated him? How can I ever face him? Oh, I'll get the door, dear. Oh, 
Orders. From now on, we're doing duets. A one, a two. I love you truly, truly. Dear. Hold on, the story's not over. In a moment, we'll see what happens. But first, here's an important message from your government. There's an exciting, important new branch of the armed forces now forming: the Winged Commandos. The wing commandos will operate Uncle Sam's fast-growing glider force. And the U.S. Army Air Forces need thousands of men to become glider pilots. Tough, self-reliant men are needed for an all-out offensive against the enemy. And make no mistake, these wing commandos will be among the leaders in our smashing attacks to crush the Axis. You may be one of the men qualified for immediate training in the six weeks course at the new Army Air Forces glider school. Listen to see if you are eligible. The Air Forces will accept the following men for training. If you are a civilian between 18 and 36 years of age who can pass an Army physical examination and now hold a pilot certificate of private grade or better, register at your nearest Civil Aeronautics Administration office. If you are a former aviation cadet with 50 hours or more of flying time at an Army, Navy, or Marine flying school who is not currently in the air services of the Armed Forces, register at the nearest CAA office or Army Air Corps headquarters. If you are an Army man who was a civilian pilot or has had flight training in the armed services, see your commanding officer. And if you can't meet these requirements, you still get your chance. Men between 18 and 36 may apply to any one of the 600 colleges of the Civil Aeronautics Administration to take a preliminary course for glider pilot training. When you complete this schooling, you are then eligible to take the regular Army Air Forces glider course. America is growing wings, big wings, fighting wings. Get your wings as a glider pilot. Join the wing commandos now. Gerald, before Julie comes downstairs, I've got a piece of man command advice for you. Keep clear of stag parties. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Foster. We've already called off our stag picnic. Say, does anybody remember me? Randolph Foster, the old fixer-upper? Well, yes, yeah, say thanks, Randolph. <laughs> that phony phone call you made saved my life. I'll pay you back someday. I'm a cash-on-the-line man, Father. Fee for impersonating the telegraph company, 75 cents. Well, okay. Here you are, Randolph. And as for you, Gerald, my fee is one American dollar. Haven't you bled me enough? <laughs> what did you do for Gerald? It was worth a dollar. One of the toughest assignments of my career. I converted a Glenville High School redhead into a first cousin. invited to have another date with Judy next Tuesday night. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Jerome Lawrence and Aline Lester. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, California Parker Distributors.